So, yeah, I may have agreed I might do some breakdancing. Just for the record, I've never done any breakdancing in my life. But, um, yeah, so I hope you've all been enjoying the conference so far. Really enjoyed the keynote today. It made me think about lots of different things about the future of programming. Will we be coding? And when he started talking about Italian food, I thought, I know exactly what I'm doing tonight. So if anyone fancies Italian food later, um, come and catch me about 6 o'clock. So yeah, getting to today's talk. Um, this is what DDD really means to me. I know we have a lot of different talks, we see a lot of different sides of DDD, but this is what it really means to me. And thinking about DDD in this way as aligning boundaries has helped me to achieve some success in my career. And I want to show you over the next half an hour or so um, the benefits you can get. I want to encourage you to think this way. But before we get into all that stuff, I'd like to ask if any of you have ever felt like this before. We're having so many meetings. Meetings to work out what meetings to have, and meetings to work out who needs to be in the meetings. Ever felt like you're having one too many meetings? Well, how about this one? We're trying to release something, but the other team, they, they've broken the shared build. They've broken the test environment. They've broken the shared database. We can't do anything because of those. Or, and by the way, I love this picture. If you look at this guy in the corner, he's like, oh my god. Anyway, who, who's ever felt like this before? Don't blame us for missing the deadline. It, it was the other team. You're working on this project, and you're waiting for some other team to finish their piece of work. And they're late. That means you're late. And when the deadline comes, it's, it's you who hasn't finished, and it's your team who gets the blame. Maybe that's just my teams, then. OK, one more. So who's ever felt like the Hulk? You've got this amazing new feature. Your customers are screaming for it. The stakeholders are whipping you to deliver it. But you're dependent on another team to do some work. And they're like, you know what? We've got bigger priorities. We, we don't care about you. Go away. <laughs> so I felt that one a few too many times. And, and all of these problems, I see them in lots of different organizations. And they really annoy me. But there's actually something that annoys me way more than all of these things. It's when I hear comments like this from developers. Wish the managers would fix it. Wish someone else would fix it. I'm just here to write code. It's, it's not my job to fix these things. And by the way, a lot of these people did look just like Hulk Hogan when they were angry. But yeah, these kind of comments, they kind of frustrate me, annoy me. They make me feel sad and make me feel, where's your ambition? Because what if, what if all these problems of having too many meetings, being blocked by other teams, all of, all of the pains we talked about, what if they're not management problems? What if they're not process problems? What if they're not necessarily just organizational problems? In fact, what if they were technical problems? And it's only with the input of software developers like you that we can actually fix these problems. And what if, by changing the boundaries in our organization, both the organizational and the technical, we could fix a lot of those problems and make our companies great places to work? So that's, that's what I think can happen. And that's the journey I want to take you on in the rest of this talk. But before we get to that, I need you to know there's a secret that all of these experts don't want you to know, the microservices experts especially. I'm going to tell you right now, in fact, no, I'm not. I'm going to let DDD's favorite SOA legend, Udi DeHaan, tell you. Does anyone want to guess what the secret is first? Pardon? You're close, not quite a silver bullet, it's a flowchart. Finding service boundaries is really damn hard. There's no flowchart. You can't just say, ah, we're working in this domain, we create this service and this service, time for lunch. 
It's not that easy, and not in the domains I've worked in anyway. And if you get your boundaries wrong, the consequences, seriously, they can be massively detrimental to your organization. And I recently met one person who found this out the hard way. So towards the end of last year, I was giving a talk about digital transformation, just because I like to troll businessy type of people. Got nothing better to do with my life. And I was talking about the importance of aligning the organizational and technical boundaries so you can iterate quickly, forget about all the meetings and stuff. I thought it was actually a really good talk. People were laughing at my jokes. Never happened before. Um, even at the end of the talk, I was getting loads of questions. The pizza went cold before we actually finished the question. So I'm thinking, that was a great talk. I was really happy. And then this guy comes up to me. He's like, um, I'm a dev manager for this company. And something you, you were speaking about was really interesting. He said, at the start of this year, my programmers came up to me. And they said, can we have six months to rewrite our big beast of a monolith into these fancy little microservice things? Who thinks they know where this is going? Anyway, he said, this guy told me I let them do it. And I said to him, that's, that's probably a fair decision, you know? It's, it's not easy. Do you rewrite, refactor, strangle the pattern, all that kind of stuff? I said, don't blame yourself if... And he went, no, 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 you don't understand. I let them do it, and now they've done it, and the work is taking three times longer. The developers are having all of these meetings. They're arguing all the time. The execs are going nuts at me, and I've got three months to save my job. What should I do? Enjoy the free pizza. <laughs> So there are no rules, it's, it's not easy, there's no flow chart, although if I bump into Udi later, I might ask him if he's found it yet. But that, that doesn't mean service boundaries, we don't have to guess. It's not like it's impossible to make good decisions. We just have to step back, do a bit of abstract thinking, and, and just think about, well, we work for an organization. This organization is a system, and it has a goal. And every decision we take should be helping our organization to achieve that goal. Forget about all the microservices, forget about the DTD stuff for now, for now, and just think, yeah, this is an organization, it has a goal. How can we create service boundaries, organizational and technical, that help us to achieve this goal? That way you know every decision you make, how does it help our company achieve its goal? Fortunately, someone's done a lot of the hard work for you, and worked out what this goal is, mostly. His name's Dan North. So he thinks it's all about creating positive business impacts and minimi continuously minimizing the lead time. Doing things that make our customers and businesses happy and profitable and doing it faster and faster. It's kind of simple when you think about it. And so, that's what I want you to focus on for now. And I want you to start, if you're not already, thinking about these kind of things. So thinking in systems. So systems thinking. Just learn to think about the big picture, the system, its goals, and all the different parts that need to work together to achieve that. Theory of constraints is this idea that there are constraints in your organization holding it back. Kind of, uh, quite often, they're bottlenecks. If you can remove those bottlenecks, your, your whole company can go a lot faster. And quite often, you can remove bottlenecks by getting your boundaries right. And finally, not finally, there's two left. One that a lot of people don't really talk about, and this is something that, yeah, annoys me. We're not talking about users enough. So we're talking about systems with goals and positive business outcomes. Understanding what your users care about is how you achieve positive business outcomes. So do some more user research. Developers, get right involved in user research. Push for that in your organization if you're not doing it. And of course, strategic DDD. Not just the technical modeling patterns, but taking a step back, thinking about the whole domain and big, big decisions that have a big impact on the, the tactical patterns you employ later. And all of these things and all my experiences lead me to think 
that organizational and technical boundaries, they should co-evolve. And this isn't happening in the companies I work for. This co-evolution where the boundaries are aligned and they change together, it's not happening. It's, they're done by different people. Developers do the technical boundaries. We kind of have managery types, agile types doing the organizational stuff. And I see things like this. We sent some people on an Agile course. They heard about that fancy cross-functional stuff. And now we've got two developers, a business analyst, and a tester all sitting at a table. That's how we do teams. Doesn't, doesn't work for me, and nor does the classic, the enterprise pass the blame, where we, um, we have layers in our organization. The front-end team, the back-end team, the orchestration team, the database team. And every piece of work has to flow through all of these teams. And when something goes wrong, they're all blaming each other. So we can do better than this. When we start forming teams, when we start thinking about boundaries, both organizational and technical, we need to be thinking with domain-driven design principles up front about problem domains, cohesive services. And so you need to start with DDD. And how you start with DDD is, completely ignoring anything DDD Borat ever tells you. The way we start is to discover our problem domain. So we need to learn some key things up front. So firstly, we care about positive business outcomes. What's going to make our customers happy, business profitable? And we can do this with tools like the Business Model Canvas. It tells us quite clearly our organization's purpose is this, our customers are these customer segments. This is what a positive business outcome looks like. And I'll be doing a workshop tomorrow about the business model canvas if anyone's interested. And also practices like event storming, helping you to think about entire domain processes, the end-to-end -end lead time. How can we refactor things and bring those lead times down? So once you've understood enough about your domain and you're starting to think about your technical and organizational boundaries, I forgot to click that. Does that make sense, what I just said? Cool. Anyway, once you've done these things, what you need to do then, in my opinion, this is what I do, is I look for things that change together for business reasons. In DDD terminology, we kind of call these things subdomains, but perhaps, perhaps not quite. But the goal here is, if we can find things that change together for business reasons, we can say, well, one team can own all of those things. Whenever we have a feature to work on, the things that will change are likely to be together in that boundary. So we can have autonomous teams. Don't need to have meetings to work out how to implement the new feature. Don't have to argue who's building this piece or this piece. Don't need all the internal politics. Of course, it's not always that easy. There's always going to be some work that flows through different teams and contexts. You can never get away from that. But what we're trying to do here is to say, well, we don't have to have the worst case every time. We can find good boundaries. We can cut out a lot of those meetings and friction and, and focus on collaborating when we have to. And what we're doing when we do this is we're using our theory of constraint skills. We're thinking, how can we minimize having to work, having to flow between two teams? Because that's where queues build up. That's where teams are blocked. That's where the lead times get longer. And so now I want to talk to you about a really great company I once had the opportunity to work for. It was so great, the teams were always fighting. I don't think, did any of the teams like each other? I don't think so. And so I, I said to them, OK, let's just start with where we are now. Let's just visualize where we think we are now, our organizational boundaries, our technical boundaries, and let's see if we can fix it. But, and this is my advice to you, just, just try and visualize where you are now. And so this is what we came up with. I gave them some clues. I'll tell you about those clues in a sec. But this is what we came up with. So it was a government agency. They deal with business property taxes. These weren't the real names of things, because if they were, I'd probably get sued. But the concepts are pretty much the same. So it's a government agency. They deal with business property taxes. Using this system, you log in as a business, and you can see all kinds of information held about your properties. 10 floors, 
50 car parking spaces, you have air conditioning, you have fancy lifts, and you can see how this information is used to calculate how much tax you pay. So that's the review stage. You can then move on to the resubmit stage. Hang on a sec, I don't have 16 car parking spaces, I only have four, please, please fix your system. And then you move on to the renegotiate phase. Well, if I, if I don't have 16 car parking spaces, I don't think I should be paying the tax for 16 car parking spaces. And then these cases get pushed over to the case management team. So we drew this diagram, and we saw this is where we are now. So firstly, can anyone see anything on here that you think looks a bit iffy or what they might change if they had the opportunity? Okay, I'll give you a clue. It's the fact that three of these subdomains are owned by two teams. We know here there's a high chance, and by the way, I put two teams to keep the diagram clear. <laughs> it wasn't just two teams in a lot of cases. So we've got two teams, they share these things that change together for business reasons. We are guaranteed that these teams are going to be fighting over things. And if they have different project managers in the different teams, both of those project managers will be fighting to be the one project manager who owns this piece of work. That was one of the problems. If you look a bit more closely, there were some dotted gray lines. And if you look at the case management system, they're having a lot of problems in that team, and they're not very happy. So firstly, they're complaining. The resubmit team, they keep changing the data in their form, and we have to keep updating our back-end UI to present that data. Same for the renegotiate team, constantly changing their data. We don't have time to keep up with these idiots in the other teams. We're too busy with other stuff. And what do you think the other teams were saying? Oh, the case management teams constantly slowing us down. If I... So there's a lot of friction here, there's a lot of pain, not a lot of work's getting done. Do you think we can fix this with some DDD principles? Anyone think we can't fix it? It's going to be a rubbish talk if we can't fix it. You didn't hear that. So here are some clues you can use to fix this kind of problem. And remember, they're just clues. So the clues I'm about to give you, they don't work in every domain. In one domain, you'll find one of these clues leads you to great boundaries. In another domain, the same clue can lead you astray. And I found out the hard way. I'm like, look, one company I work for, this worked for me in the last company. We are doing it this way. This absolutely worked for me. A couple of months later, um, yeah, OK, sorry, guys. <laughs> so it doesn't always work in every domain. So they're just clues. If you use them and they don't work for you, I take no responsibility. So the first clue is the traditional DDD clue, language. We find languages that is consistent and used together. So in this system, we've got resubmit. This subdomain, this context is all about business properties, car parking spaces, floors, air conditioning. We then move on to renegotiate. The language changes completely. It's all about renegotiating. It's tax, it's finance, it's government policy, all that stuff. We've got different boundaries, different language. The next clue is data uniqueness. Forgot the order that these points were in. So data uniqueness. So if we have some data, and whenever this data changes, we have two other parts that have to change with it, there's kind of a dependency there. But sometimes it has to, and sometimes it doesn't. It's really difficult, but it's a big clue in many domains. And if we think about this government agency, you've got the resubmit team are changing the data, case management system having to update and all the meetings. So it's a clue here, it's a big clue, that this case management system, mm, is it the right boundary? Next clue is exclusive domain experts. So I've worked in some domains, and different parts of the domain have very different domain experts. And if we think about this example, in the resubmit, we're talking about property features, resubmit and review. We're talking about property features. The domain expert here is someone, a surveyor. He goes around to properties. He measures the number of windows and car parks. Must be a really fascinating job. But then we move on to renegotiate, and now we're talking about calculating tax and tax bans and all this stuff. Completely different domain expert. It's like a finance expert in this domain. I'm sure that's a really interesting job too. 
and this one is a classic business process steps. Sometimes we can take a domain when it's kind of a linear process, we can break it down into those process steps and we've got boundaries. Maybe it isn't really damn hard all the time, but sometimes business process steps can lead you astray. So think about this domain. We've got review, resubmit, renegotiate, case management. We think that's our business process, but what often happens with business process steps is they're not really business process steps. So, and this is what's happening for this government agency. If we open up that case management system, there are two different responsibilities in there. A case worker can either approve or reject a resubmit case, and they can approve or reject or recalculate your taxes in a renegotiate. So it's not a business process step. It just looks like one. And that's why we're having a lot of these pains. Another clue you can use is existing boundaries. I'm sure Conway has something to say about that, so I won't touch on it too much. And of course, bottlenecks. If you've got boundaries and all your domain-driven design skills are telling you these are great boundaries, the language is consistent, if you've got bottlenecks in your teams, if you've got one team who has too much work, I don't care what domain-driven design tells me. They have a bottleneck, we need to fix the bottleneck. That's more important than pure models. So I probably won't get invited back to any more DDD conferences for saying that, but that's actually how I see things. So let's save the world. Here's how we fixed it. So firstly, we don't have two teams owning a subdomain unless we really have to. We don't want those bottlenecks. It's no good for anybody. If we cannot have those handover phases, it makes everyone happier. But importantly, the case management system is gone now. So the resubmit team, they own a piece of work from start to finish. I'll update the front end UI, I'll collect some new data, and the same developers on the same feature can update the back end UI and present the new data. It's almost as if it was meant to be that easy in the first place. Same thing's happening in the review team. They were having a dashboard, they were having all the other teams throwing feature requests at them. It's gone away now. Instead, we have these composite applications. We'll get to those later. Um, yeah, so visualization, I'm not going to touch on this too much, but when you're looking for boundaries, when you're trying to change your boundaries, you have to be able to visualize your ideas to win over your colleagues to present your case. So here are some tips I found really useful for doing this. Firstly, on your diagram, indicate if a subdomain or a team is customer facing. If teams are sharing a subdomain, clearly that's probably a bottleneck in your system, so make it visible. Why do two contexts integrate? When you, when you present this information and you show why things integrate, your domain experts sometimes tell you, hey, we never told you to do it that way. That's, that's not a dependency in our world. You can find things like this really easily just by visualizing them. And how frequently is the collaboration between two different subdomains? If it's not happening a lot, it doesn't really matter too much. If it's happening all the time, use a big red line or something to make it very clear. And the physical location. So I was working with one travel company, and their two teams who were collaborating the most were based in um, two completely different time zones. Yeah, if you've got a dependency between two teams, the longer the time zone, it kind of makes things a bit more difficult and leads to longer lead times. So just make it clear and start thinking, are there alternatives? And of course, if a team's a bottleneck, make it clear. Make it something that everyone understands fully. Click a glitch, back on track. So, what, so you're going to have all these different ideas about boundaries. It's going to look great on paper. Yeah, we fixed it. We've got these new boundaries. These teams won't be depending on each other anymore. But you don't, un, you don't know the benefits until your design is a reality, until work is flowing through your new system with your new boundaries. So you, you can't know up front if it's going to work or not. It has to be an iterative process. But what you can do, what I've done before, is to simply create these fancy diagrams and show off, look what I've made, wow. But then I go through previous work items in JIRA or the work item system. I work for Salesforce. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say JIRA. So I'll say JIRA one more time, JIRA. So yeah, you can go through your previous work items 
and just say, if we had these new boundaries and we were working on this right now, how many teams would be involved in that piece of work? One team, one team, one team. This is good. I think if you can get about 80% of your work is owned by one team, that's a really good sign that you've, you've achieved great autonomy. Of course, it's 80%. It's not, it's not a science. Don't start quoting me that 80%, the magical 80%. I'm not, not that, I don't believe it that strongly. But there's something else I want to tell you about. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of full end-to-end -end ownership, vertical ownership, a team that owns everything they need to ship a feature from front to back end, like we talked about in this example. But in some cases, in some domains, in some products, even that isn't a best practice. So one company I worked at was um, digital media and streaming. And we found that the most changes were happening to the user journey. Our data, our APIs became really stable. And this, this full vertical ownership, it wasn't the fastest way to deliver features. So we did have a separate team who owns the user journey, even though that user journey spanned multiple different subdomains. So I'm, I'm just saying to you, no flowchart, <laughs> it's not easy, things change. Now for something controversial. Am I really going to do this? OK, I'm going to do it. Bounded contexts, they need a makeover. So I'm finding nowadays that bounded contexts are very technical. And the microservices community, you've done this to our bounded contexts. Five years ago, if you were using the repository pattern, you were doing DDD. And nowadays, if you're creating microservices and calling them bounded contexts, you're doing DDD. It's so simple. Bounded contexts have become very ambiguous. And there's this fascination, as Alberto says here, oh, microservices and bounded contexts, there's a one-to-one -one mapping. It's so easy. We've solved all the problems. But that's not working for me. The focus has become too technical. So I want to suggest to you to and if I haven't already been barred from future DDD conferences, I definitely will be after this slide. I want you to forget about bounded context, and I want you to think autonomy context, because the discussion should be, how can we have autonomous teams and services? Those two things have to co-evolve together. With bounded context, we start thinking microservices and technical pieces, but those two thoughts, the organizational and the technical boundaries. It's the same process to find those boundaries. So I hope, it was, I hope someone finds that useful, because I won't be able to say it at any more DDD conferences. So what do autonomy contexts look like to me? I, I don't really care that much. If you want to have one microservice, two microservices, one microservice sharing a database with another, two microservices with two databases. The technical patterns, if you get your high-level logical boundaries right, the technical patterns, they don't really matter that much to me. This is what I found. And so if you focus only on the technical patterns, and I, I see this conversation on Twitter every week, you're using synchronous requests, you're doing it wrong. You need to use asynchronous, then start asynchronous threads, asynchronous messaging. It's like Groundhog Day. Every single week, the same debate about asynchronous messaging. Please, can we just not talk about this anymore? It's boring now. And this is what we get when we start talking about bounded context. It's become attached to all of these technical things. So that's why I think, forget about bounded context. And so there is one technical pattern I think is really useful, and we need to focus on this bit a lot more, which is the UI. So we have all of these fancy, fine-grained microservices on the back end. And then on the front end, we have monolithic UIs where one team owns it and there's a handover phase. So as I talked about earlier, full vertical ownership, dedicated front-end teams, it's not easy. But let's not just focus on these big front-end teams by default. In fact, think about composite applications. And I, I fully recommend, this is how I think about building UIs. I try and build them with these practices in this order. So firstly, if I can integrate two applications with HTML links, that is really, really easy. 
Each subdomain has its own front-end application, and they're connected by HTML links. Your user doesn't know anything about the back-end architecture, because you present it as a coherent journey. But that doesn't always work. You can't always have that. So sometimes, sorry, this clicker is not in sync. We've just covered that. So sometimes you can't have the links. Sometimes you've got, sometimes you have one page, and it needs to show presentation and data from two different subdomains. So you can't just have links connecting them. So this is where we can use UI composition. I think Udi has been talking about this for, I don't know, what is it, five, ten years now? A lot of people say, oh, it won't work here. But it does work in many situations. And OpenTable have this great library for doing UI composition. Anyone here from OpenTable? Hi, Safe. So yeah, you can talk to him about UI composition. He's an expert. And also, OK, if you can't do the composite applications, then yeah, you have a dedicated front-end team. You can use the BFF pattern that everyone thinks is great. But I would fully encourage you to try and leave that as a last resort. So we're almost finished. I just want to say a few final things. I want to say that you can actually, by putting these things into practice, you can have a massive, massive impact in your organization. If any of you have that mindset, I'm just a developer, I can't fix these management problems, you can. A lot of people, they just get their heads down and they let, try and let the managers fix it. They think they can't fix it. But you probably can. In many organizations, it's developers who fix these kind of problems. And so here's how I would advise you to do it. Here are some general practices. You don't have to put a Superman outfit on and start going, unleash the DDD. But if you can, please tweet it. So what you can do is just, just, just start thinking in systems, first of all. Just try and think about the high-level goals. Just try and put your mindset in that place of system-level behaviors. And then, yeah, do some domain discovery. Business model canvas, event storming, lots of different activities. I'm sure you've already seen lots of activities for discovering your domain already here in talks and workshops. And then visualize where you are now. No one can stop you creating a diagram of where you think your boundaries, your organizational and technical boundaries are. No one can stop you doing that. I hope not anyway. And you can be clever. You can think to yourself, can I fix these problems? And you can do it all on paper. You can just take those clues, apply them to what you know about your domain. Think about, if I could do these boundaries my way, I would have this boundary and this boundary. And once you've got a good design, OK, that's, that's when things start getting a bit more difficult, because you need to start convincing people. But I would say, just start iterating in small steps. If you've got one technical piece, you can break it down into two technical pieces and say to your manager, hey, we've got these two technical pieces. If we had two different teams owning each piece, we could get work done a lot faster. But those, yeah, those aren't easy conversations to have. It might take tenacity. You also need to start working on the organizational side. And so I've got a tip for you. When you're in a discussion, when you think you've got this amazing idea, when you think you've fixed all your company's problems, this is how you should justify your decisions. I propose this change to our boundaries, our teams, our technical, because it will allow us to deliver value to customers more frequently. If you can justify your decisions with that in mind, I can't think of a better way to convince people that you should change your organization. And this is what I always do. Frame it from the customer's point of view. So we're almost finished now. It's almost over. But I just want to tell you, when you do these things, you put them in practice, you get it right, it means something. It's special. It feels great. You feel great you've gone on the journey, and you feel great that you've, your job is better. You're not having all of those meetings. In, in DDD Borat's terms, I think, no, I'm not going to say that. But I just want to give you a quick example. So back in the start of my career, I was working at, I've worked at different companies. And all of these meetings, all of the meetings were just doing my head in. I couldn't, I couldn't enjoy my job. 
working for companies, lots of meetings, teams always arguing, missed deadlines. I thought, is, is this normal for the industry? I mean, I love coding. I just don't get to do any of it. So I was really thinking, is this the career for me? And then I heard about this other company. They were doing this thing called continuous delivery. They had developers who were writing blog posts. They had an open source GitHub account. This is going back a few years. Wow, they're actually writing code. I even heard they had a good manager. I definitely want to work here. So I got in contact with the manager. I'm like, hey, can I come and work for you? You look so amazing. And he said to me, we're not hiring juniors right now. Can you come back in a few months? So I didn't take his hint. I did come back in a few months. Hey, do you have a job for me now? He's like, oh, can you come back in an, another few months? I'm like, I'll tell you what, can I just have an interview now? And then when you're hiring, I, I can come and work for you straight away. He looked at me really uncomfortably, like, oh, I wish this boy would just go away. He said, OK, you can have an interview. So I had a first stage interview, and I passed. Had a second stage interview, and I passed. And suddenly, they had a job for me. And that was just the start. When I started working at this company, it was absolutely incredible. First day of work, I paired up with a senior engineer. We did some TDD. We implemented a feature, clicked a button, and deployed it by about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Wow, mind blown. Six months later, same thing's happening every day. Literally six months later, I still can't believe how we're developing code. I've had those years of meetings and pain and not getting anything done, and now we're just delivering value all the time. It feels absolutely amazing. And, and I said to people, how, how did you get here? I just I can't understand how, how you got here to be so amazing when all of these other companies having all of those different problems. And one of the engineers told me, uh, the manager, he started here a couple of years ago. As a developer, he started talking about all this DDD stuff, theory of constraint stuff, thinking he was really cool. And he started showing us how to change our boundaries, both the teams and the technical. And we slowly started making these changes. And we got to where we are now. And literally, after, I just, that was when I just started reading about DDD, theory of constraints, all the time. It sent me crazy. But that manager, he is now the head of engineering at a huge, huge organization with businesses in different industries. They've got some of the smartest people working in that company. And I just think to myself, wow, not bad for a software developer who had the audacity to think that he could change and transform organizations. And all of you have that opportunity, so make the most of it. Here's where I recommend you get started. Thank you very much. Yeah, so what he's saying is, how can we trust developers to do things right? Kind of. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but how can we trust developers to get these technical boundaries right for the business interest versus their own interest? And this is a really relevant question. And the way I would answer this, I would probably say, we need to minimize the gap between developers and business to start with. So the developers should understand those goals. And when I talk about things like the business model canvas, um, I'm talking about getting the proper delivery teams in there, like business representatives, developers, and we're focused around these system level goals. And if we make things, and if we visualize things, we can have these open discussions between technical and non-technical people. And hopefully, the, the goal we're looking for becomes obvious. And developers can't do the wrong thing. In theory, probably doesn't work in practice. So you split the, the teams into the service boundaries, but the business priorities change based on those boundaries? Absolutely. So I've seen this. You've got APIs that are very flexible when a company starts up. You're trying to discover how these things should work. And then you kind of, um, later in the company's life, or the maturity of a certain service or capability kind of slows down, and you're innovating on the customer experience, the user journey. So this is what I was talking about. I think it was point two about co-evolution. So if you've got, with a business, we design the teams. With the developers, we do the technical pieces. Both things should feed back. So the developers say, look, this isn't changing all that much anymore. These boundaries aren't working for us. Let's change the teams. 
Does that make sense? Or? So what I've noticed is this kind of thing tends to happen quite a lot at the start of new, new initiatives, new projects. And I think at that point where your boundaries aren't stabilizing, I think that's when you do have to focus more on the collaboration aspect. Maybe in that situation, it's best to defer breaking things up and have the monolith until things become clearer. I think it depends on quite a few factors. Do I have to name those factors? Is that the it depends thing? Anyone else heard of that? You're not allowed to say it depends? OK, don't worry. Can you be more precise about uh, what you mean uh, by the data uniqueness? Yeah, so let's use this government agency as an example. So the resubmit team, they had this form for proposing amendments. So I don't have 16 car parking spaces, I have like five now. So they, the data here is about capturing that information from the customer, about changes to the property. But then that information is captured in one place and it has to be transported to the back end case management system where the case manager looks at it and reviews the data. So those two contexts both, both need that data. And when the resubmit team wants to change the form and capture new properties, that information also has to be updated on the back end. So the principle I was saying is, if you've got some data, any data, and whenever you change that data, you've got two different teams or technical things that have to change with it, yeah, that dependency can tell you those boundaries may be lacking autonomy. But it's, it's not always. Sometimes, sometimes data doesn't change that much. It may change once every six months. In that case, the costs aren't too high. Yes, so we have one context that publishes an event or sends some data. I'm not forcing you to use asynchronous messaging here. We have one context that wants to share some data with another context. The kind of patterns I've seen emerging here are the data means different things in two different contexts. If the data means the same thing in both of those contexts, it's more of a dependency. Oh, I can't think of a great example now. What's the one Udi uses on his course? He's like, yeah, when you purchase something, your address at the time of purchase goes on the order. But that's not the customer's main address. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I think it's a clue. If it changes in one place for the same reasons as another, that's a clue. But again, it's, it's really difficult. It comes down to fine-grained semantics, the differences in your domain. But, but just keep that in your mind. Just think, OK, we're changing some data here. What else is changing at the same time? Are we doing this a lot? Is this slowing us down? Could we reshape the boundaries so all of those things that change are owned by one team? Would that allow us to deliver work faster? OK, so I'll qualify all of the things I just said were, I'm thinking about quite, quite big companies. We've got, I don't know, at least 20 developers, or probably more than that, up to hundreds of developers. I'm thinking big, big companies. In DDD terminology, I think unless your domain is all about identity, unless you're building an identity system, I think that's usually something generic you can buy off the shelf. Um, if you don't have to have any influence over how that thing works, yeah, I'd just try and buy it off the shelf. Or when I worked in government, we used a centralized government system that does authentication. Oh, yeah, so I'd say that's another company. If it wasn't part of my domain, if we didn't have to do all identity, I'd just use another company's service and hope they maintain it. But yeah, you get to situations where it doesn't quite do this one thing. Could you do this for us? No, we're too busy. So yeah, you, it's that... You don't own it, you don't control it, which means you can get benefit of economies of scale. That's where I would look at the system of work. I would say, what did we work on for the past six months? What would be the optimum way to structure our teams and boundaries to do this work fastest? That's what I'd be looking at, but yeah, it's, it seemed like a very, lots of different things to consider there. But I'd be, instead of the domain there, I'd definitely be thinking more about the work that flows through our system. When you take a problem domain, you break it down into these smaller pieces. You can never say up front, OK, anything that changes will be inside this boundary or this boundary. So there's always going to be things that happen between different teams. But my point is, if we focus on autonomy, because right now I just see people talking about microservice and bounded context as technical things. If we take that thinking process just up a layer and we think about teams and technical boundaries, I think that's how we can make better decisions but still when you yeah you're always going to have teams that have to work together and 
it's a, it's, a, it's a separate problem that you can optimize in different ways. So one thing I've seen in companies, they're doing things like a digital transformation or an agile transformation. And they think, we'll set up a digital team. They can do all the front end stuff and then we'll have the back end enterprise IT teams. And these teams have very different cultures. There's like a massive wall between them. They're both working on different parts of the same system, but the culture is completely different. So I think we have to see building software as like one cohesive, not a team, but a team of teams who all have the same kind of visions and values, like continuous delivery, um, similar principles, and they're always sharing ideas. Thank <laughs> you.